I'm here because if we lose our sharks, we will lose our ocean. And so many people, they kind of say, well, wow, what did you just say? Did you just say if we lose our sharks, we will lose our ocean? So yeah, so let me help you get that from a high level standpoint. If you remove the sharks from a reef, the second tier predators explode, like the grouper and the snapper, wipe out the fish that maintain the reef, the reef dies, all the life bugs out. You remove the pelagic sharks, the open ocean sharks, the squid explode like locusts, wipe out all the fry hiding in the grass, and you end up with a lifeless abyss of ocean. We've seen this in the Sea of Cortez. We've seen this off the Pacific side of Chile. So sharks are crucial to the future of the, of the ocean. They are the apex predators. But we got one significant problem on our hands. We lack the fundamental data of our giant sharks to manage them and the future ocean toward abundance. We are on the no plan plan for the future of the ocean. We lack fundamental data sets to put the course of the ocean toward an abundant future. It's easy to understand why on our giant sharks we don't understand where they mate, where they give birth in their full migratory range. I'm talking about 18 or 20 foot sharks that weigh thousands of pounds. A scientist and his intern are not gonna capture a shark like that and create a safe working environment for 15 minutes to leverage the world's latest technology to solve the puzzle of their lives. And if no sharks, there is no future. So what could we do, you know, it's like, well, so what? You know, what, how are sharks trending? Does it matter that we don't know? What's going on? The fact is, 200,000 sharks will die today. 200,000 will die today. Up to 100 million sharks a year die. Now, back in 2007, I'm working on the ocean with my wife and Captain Brett McBride, and we're, we're capturing and releasing billfish with scientists and making TV shows about it, tuna, wahoo. This one guy looks at me and says, we lose our large sharks, so there's not going to be any billfish, tuna, or wahoo. It's kind of like, what did you just say? He said that to me. I learned what's going on with the sharks, learning 200,000 a day, and it suddenly dawns on me, we have to learn something that's never been learned before at a rate, an unprecedented rate that's never been achieved before, because we're losing 200,000 sharks a day. And that was in 2007, and that's when I committed my life, and my wife did, to solving this puzzle. It was going to take a unique ship, it was going to take a unique crew. It was going to take a different approach. People are disconnected with the ocean. Shocking. It's been three generations since someone brought a passion for the ocean and awareness for the ocean into the everyday household scale. So that became our mission. We only, not only have to do what hasn't been done, we have to pour the world's oceans into people's lives at an unprecedented scale. So we committed ourselves to doing this. The question was, could we create a common vision with a selfless disposition? Could we bring communities together that typically didn't work together? How were we going to pay for it? Well, at first, we leveraged television. We sold 30 hours of TV to National Geographic Channel and 10 hours to the History Channel, took half the money, funded the research, and the other half the money to uh, make the shows. And this worked for a while. It also really changed the disposition of our funding. It allowed us to help people and disrupt this institutional approach to research. I thought everybody worked on the ocean because they were trying to create a future for the ocean. It turns out that people are competing for grants, and so people aren't collaborating and sharing data. But when it came to this space, we were the only place in the world where you could study a large, giant shark and let it go. So we leveraged that to disrupt the institutional approach to research. We invited all scientists in when we came and studied sharks and delivered sharks to them safely from every institution with every inst discipline to maximize the leap forward on every animal we touched. We felt like this was our obligation. Disrupting this created a radical rate of learning that we hadn't achieved in a long period of time. And we've been able and had the good fortune to help over 80 scientists from over 40 institutions, over 50 published papers being written around our work just since 2007. 22 expeditions, exploring at a rate that's not been achieved, learning what hadn't been achieved at a speed that hadn't been achieved. And so we started to learn all this new stuff, right? And uh, it seemed impossible at first, but I come from the same dinner table Greg Fisher does. I came earlier. My parents used to say things like, an inch is a cinch, a yard is hard. Don't get overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge. Just keep inching forward. So we inched forward, and we achieved things that were impossible, right? And then everybody started arguing about who owns the data? Who really owns the data? And so I decided, hmm, 
No one's going to own the data. We are going to open source the data. So we open sourced the data to the world, and the world then piled into a charismatic research project, first time that they could ever be in a research project learning at the same time as the scientists. You're watching the track, a one-month track, of a 4,000-pound female shark named Mary Lee off the east coast of the United States. She has 80,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> I'm pissed at Mary Lee. She's got three times as many Twitter followers as I do. <laughs> Lydia has 20,000. Catherine the shark has another 20,000 giving sharks a voice, and you're seeing also an absolute data explosion just since 2012. So this is world-class substance, right? If we're going to make a future, uh, an impact on the future of the planet, you've got to have world-class substance. And when we open source the tracker, the students piled in like sharks and dinosaurs, right? The kids started following their favorite sharks. Now, this was compelling to me. We had the attention of the kids. Now, also coming from the same dinner table with my parents, anybody know what the biggest room in the world is? Biggest room in the world? The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement, right? <laughs> so no matter how good you get at anything, no matter what you achieve, the room for improvement never shrinks. So what sort of disposition are we going to live our lives with? Are we going to be satisfied, complacent people? Or when we achieve things that people say are impossible, and then another thing they said they're impossible, are we going to keep reaching because now we just have a vista from which to see further than we've ever seen? So we went out and got a K through 12 STEM-based educational curriculum written open sourced and given it away so while the kids follow their favorite shark, they learn math and physics and science in the now. Exploration in the now. Science in the now. Education in the now. Everybody lives in the now now, right? <laughs> but you don't want to be the tree in the forest that no one hears. So world-class substance is great. But if you got no scale, you can't move the needle for the planet. So by open sourcing everything, really inspired by Google, Twitter, Facebook, right? Create content, give it away, create radical scale, monetize the scale, not the content or the data. Give that away, share it. So we began to open source videos while we were exploring, open source the science. There's free apps, O-Search apps. You can track the phones yourself, the sharks yourselves right now from your phone. You can go to osearch.org where you download the free curriculum. And the appetite of the earned media space. If you're doing something that's newsworthy in the modern world of connectivity, the world's changing so fast, anyone can change the world, right? A shark with a voice can change the world. You feed the earned media space content in a real story. They will tell your story thousands of times a year, creating 7 billion earned media impressions in just last year. So now we got world-class substance, world-class scale, integrating into that content the socially innovative companies that make it all possible. So you got the practical expertise of the fishermen, the world-class academic coming together to create the data and the science to affect policy, all funded by the socially innovative companies that want to be part of that scale. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because this is a model that can be applied to things beyond white sharks. This is about pioneering exploration to close essential data gaps, to create a future for the planet, leveraging technology in the world of connectivity to be totally inclusive. Inclusion is inspiring. To create the data set we need today to affect policy. While we give away a long-term educational program to create the data-driven centrist that has the STEM-based skills that the socially innovative companies need to get a good job. And they are the future resource leaders. We need them to be data-driven centrists, not polarizing fringe thinkers. If you are a polarizer or a fringe person in a nonprofit space, in the ocean space, while we are trending down, you are as bad as a poacher. It is time for data-driven, centrist conversations and practical progress, including the very companies that built the world, because they are the only ones with the scale and capacity to create the future for the world all while we leverage the earned media space to tell that story, to tell that story at radical scale, to create everyday household awareness that we haven't seen in multiple generations. We must be inclusive. We must be centrist. We must be pursuing practical progress that's based on data, not emotional fringe polarizers. And that is what OSERT's about. And it is a, a model that can be repeated for anything that is crucial for the future of mankind or the planet. Leverage scale, not the data. Give it away. 
right? And so you go back to the dinner table where this all started from my brother and myself. We know nothing's impossible, right? Because an inch is a cinch, a yard is hard, right? And even when we achieve what's possible, we're not going to stop there because we all live in the biggest room in the world, which is the room for, right? But what brings it all together at the end, if you really want to make a move at a global level, is the most important thing my parents ever taught us both and the rest of my brothers and sisters, is that anything is possible if you don't care who gets the credit. Anything is possible if you don't care who gets the credit. Thanks for having me.